Before you do the down your fast, I want you to watch this entire video. I've seen so many people's lives destroyed because of this fast. I've seen people go through unnecessary warfare because of this fast. They don't understand what this is. And a lot of times people don't realize this, that in the, in the spirit realm, right? They don't care about your ignorance. There are certain rules of engagement that happens that if you're unaware of those rules of engagements and you engage in something, look, I had a time in my life when I was so depressed. I was so suicidal and that's not me. And I've been fasting and I'm like, I just finished fasting. Why is it that, you know, I'm feeling like this? What's going on? So I want you to watch this entire video. You're going to learn some things about this fast. You're going to learn some things, um, how unbiblical this fast is and why you should not do this Daniel Day fast until you watch this whole thing. We're going to break down a lot of different things. So make sure that as you're watching this, Make sure that you're sharing this link with a friend, you're sharing it with someone, anyone that, that wants to, to fast, right? I see so many believers make this mistake. You're part of a church, you're part of a fellowship, you're part of a prayer group, and they decide to go on a 21-day Daniel fast, and you just blindly, you know what? They're going on a fast, uh, this Daniel fast, so I'm going to go on this fast as well. But what you don't realize, there are things that are happening that because of your ignorance is going to hurt you more than it can help you. So make sure that you're sharing this. And I want to dive deep into this today. OK, I want to dive deep into this today um, because I'm not just talking from what I heard. I'm talking from personal firsthand experience of what happened. So I understand all the different dynamics that goes on with this thing. So you got to understand something, right? Let's go to Matthew chapter four, right? Let's go to Matthew four. So I just don't want to say things. And then people think, oh, you know, um, I'm just making it up. Let's go to the word of God. So let's go to Matthew four, whatever version that you want to use. I'm going to just read this from. Um, the NLT version. So you can have the NIV, you can have the King James. But the reason I'm reading it from this, because um, for those that need simplicity, I know sometimes the King James, for some people like, man, that is so hard in this. So I want to bring down to a language that all of us can really grasp, you know. Um, so let's go to Matthew 4. It says this. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by, there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scripture says people did not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Mouth of God. So I want you guys to go read the whole thing, but. One thing you got to understand about fasting, right? Even before we look into Daniel, is that fasting attracts temptation. Fasting attracts spirits. Anytime that you set your mind that you want to fast, you've, if you've ever fasted, right, for any period of time, the day you decide to fast is the day that you get unexpected things that people that have never offered you anything, they want to offer to take you out. They want to offer to do things for you. People that you haven't spoken to in a long time, sometimes for years, sometimes even decades. Now, all of a sudden, they just pop out of nowhere. They want to, you know, come back into your life. This thing want to happen. Because fasting attracts spirits. Now, spirits, both good and bad, both angelic or divine and demonic. 
So you, you got to understand something before you even decide to go in a fast. I believe that there are times, you know, fasting, you have to be led, right? There's some people that believe, listen, I feel like fasting, you know, I'm just going to fast. I'm not talking about fasting for the purpose of your health. I'm not talking about fasting for the purpose of losing weight. Though when you do fast, you're going to lose weight as well. But I'm talking about fasting for the purpose of getting closer to God. Biblical fast and Daniel fast is not one of them. We're going to dive in deep into that. So if you've ever experienced this, when you fast or you decide to fast, the temptation that you are trying to overcome is going to increase significantly. It is going to increase immensely because there are spirits that are attracted to the person that you desire to become. So when you want to fast, look, spirit beings, they don't need to eat any food. They don't need to drink any water. Matter of fact, spirit beings, they can, you know, they just, they just live forever, right? They do have a beginning, right? But we just, they just live. So when you begin to fast, you are attracting spirits, good spirits and demonic spirits. So when Jesus was led, you would think that the savior of the world, you would think that, you know, the creator of the universe, that after he was fast, that he was filled up, that those demons would just run away from him. Like, oh, he's fasted. You know, we're going to get closer to him now because he's on fire. But you got to understand that when you make up your mind to fast, you are attracting temptation. The fastest way to attract temptation is to fast. So that's why sometimes you see people that want to fast like they're going to have an addiction, right? And you're like, you know what? I'm going to fast. I'm going to sit God about this addiction. I got to get a break doing this. You know, I'm tired of doing this thing, whatever that, that addiction is. So you're going to fast and it's something like, oh my goodness, all the cravings you had to spike up, the desires you had, you spiked up and all this feelings, the urges, whatever it is, it just increased to a different level. That's because you're, you're cleaning out your system, right? Your spirit man is rising up. And the spirit beings are feeling more connected to you. God and the devil feel more closest to you when you fast. God and the devil are drawn to you when you fast. Why do you think in occult? One of the requirements that they have is you have to fast. Fasting in the demonic world is not optional. It's not optional too in, in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, but when you, when you fast, he said, if you fast or when you feel like fasting, fasting is mandatory, both in the kingdom of God and in the demonic kingdom. So when you look at the life of Daniel, Daniel served over 70 years with um, Nebuchadnezzar II, Belshazzar, Darius the Mede and Cyprus the Great. Now, I want to give you a backstory about this because we want to dive into this thing so you understand that. Daniel never intended to go on a Daniel fast, right? When Daniel um, prayed, let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Let's take a look at that. I want to show you guys the words. So you're not thinking, you know, Matthew is just um, making his things up. Let's go to Daniel 10. And I want to highlight from verse 12 to 13. So go to Daniel 10. Now, you can read the whole thing to get the scope of this. Okay. You can read the whole thing. But verse 10 said this. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request had been heard in heaven. Right. Your request had been heard in heaven. Let me go back. And he said unto me, oh, verse 11, he said this. And he said unto me, oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak unto thee and that stand upright for, for unto thee. I am now sent. And when he, he has spoken these words unto me, and I stood up trembling. So Daniel 10 says, and when he, behold, he touched me. And he was telling him that. When you first open up your mouth to pray, your prayers were heard. 
people don't understand. This is a revelation that I got. I got this revelation that blew my mind. There's spirit beings that existed during the time of Daniel. They knew Daniel very well. You got to understand this spirit beings, their memory is, is, is amazing. It's not perfect. They don't remember. They don't know everything, but they have an impeccable memory. So there are spirit beings that the day that Daniel got on his knees to pray to God for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people, those same spirit beings are still alive today. So when you say you want to go on a Daniel fast, the same demonic spirit beings, the same angelic and divine beings that heard Daniel prayed, that knew what Daniel was, was talking about, those same spirits now will come after you. Now, this is really deep. When I got that revelation, and you're probably saying, Matthew, you know, what do you mean? You know, just because I said I want to go on a Daniel fast, you know, all these demons are coming after me. There is power. And your legacy. There's power in a legacy and there's power in the name. Now, the, that's why the Bible said that, you know, the name of Jesus above all the names. There's no name greater than the name of Jesus, right? At the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee must bow. So there are ancient spirits that are connected to this Daniel fast. And ancient spirits have amazing, impeccable wisdom. Not perfect. So when Daniel decided to, to cry out to God, those spirits heard him. They saw him. Now I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 19. I'm going to tie this in for you. I want you to go to Acts chapter 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts 19. And let's go to verse 11 through 17. Okay, let's go to verse 11 to 17. Now, here's what it says. And God wrought special miracles from the KJV King James Version by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the devil and the evil spirit went out of them. Now, verse 13 says this. Then certain of the vagabonds, Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, you're probably wondering, what, what does that have to do anything with Daniel? Those were ancient spirits that understand the importance of a name. Not just a name, but your name is connected to your relationship with God. So every time that your name is echoed in the spirit realm, there is a certain uh, connection that an attachment that you have. So when you have a deep connection with this, with, with the Lord, when your name is mentioned because of the Lord Jesus, not because of you, there is a significant impact because they know that name. You got to understand that the spirit realm is so real and it's so deep. It is not something light and it's not something to play with. So these seven sons of Sceva, they're calling on a name that they did not, they had not built the capacity to handle what came with that name. So most people are doing this Daniel fast. They have not built the capacity to what Daniel was. And we're going to look at that now. All right. So let's dive into the historic part of this. And then at the end, I'm going to tie it all in. I promise you it's going to make sense. It's going to make sense. And as you're watching this, make sure that you're liking. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you're subscribing to this. But when I got this revelation, it changed my life. And I understood why when I would go on this so-called Daniel fast, there is certain warfare that I had to deal with that was unnecessary. And 
you're probably dealing with unnecessary warfare. See, most of the times people don't realize this, that even when Jesus Christ was alive, you can check the Bible and I stand to be corrected. Jesus never intentionally say, you know what? I am going to find where all those demons are and I'm going to cast them. I'm finding them. I'm going to this place. I'm going to look for them. I'm, now, as he was preaching, they happened to be there. He dealt with them when they came. And that was a great revelation because a lot of times, most of us, we end up fighting unnecessary spiritual warfare. We end up fighting unnecessary spiritual battles because of ignorance. In the spirit realm, they don't care how ignorant you are. They don't care how ignorant I am. There are rules of engagement that you need to understand. If you do not understand the rules of engagement in the realm of the spirit, they will come after you. So you got you to really, really understand this. So Daniel, here's the summary. Daniel served under the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire. Now, those two empires, they were, they were you know, different. And I'm going to do a little deep dive to help you understand the difference between the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire. Now, Daniel served um, from about 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. with the Babylonian Empire and from about 539 B.C. to 535 B.C. Um, with the Persian Empire. So for over 66 years, Daniel served with the Babylonians under the Babylonian rule, under the Babylonian system, you know, um, and, and that was something that was, was significant because as you're going to learn, the way that Babylonians dealt with people, dealt with religion, their style was completely different from the Persian. So Daniel was under Babylonian rule. He had to operate under certain, certain things. Now, a little bit about the life of Daniel. You know, Daniel was taken to captivity. He was taken captive to Babylon when he was about 15 to 17 years old. Um, and this is around probably 605 BC. You know, he was he was more like a teenager. So you could imagine being captured as a teenager and being taken to a land that he would eventually die in. You know, Daniel longed to go back to, you know, to his homeland. But he couldn't. He was in captive. More on that later on. Now, Daniel came from the his homeland of Judah. He was from the tribe of Judah. Um, and despite all the things that Daniel went through, he kept his faith. Now, here's one thing that I, I, I've heard about Daniel before. And I used to ask this question, right? I used to ask this question, you know, was Daniel married? Did Daniel have any kids? When I found the answer to this, it just touched me. Daniel was a eunuch. He was made a eunuch. And that was a common practice uh, for royal officials to ensure loyalty. So that meant Daniel would never marry or have a family and that was a significant personal sacrifice. So Daniel couldn't have kids. Daniel wasn't allowed to get married. They were there just primarily for loyalty of the king and because of Daniel's gift. So can you imagine just having your manhood just stripped away from you? You could never have kids. You could never have a family. You could never get married. And all you could do is just serve the king, serve the, serve the kingdom. So I could even just imagine, my goodness, just the, the trauma from that alone, from how they, they would just castrate these men to not have any kids. All they did, all their lives was about just the king's business in the palace all the time, serving the king. So Daniel... You could imagine the pain that came from that. I'm sure a lot like I'm sure like most people, Daniel wanted to have a family. I'm sure Daniel desired like any other man. 
as a kid, I'm sure that Daniel probably saw, you know, you know, relationships, marriages around. He wanted to, you know, want to have his own family. I'm sure Daniel had desires and aspirations to want to start a family. But when he was captured, Daniel, that was stripped from him. He could not have kids or start a family. The king was his family. The guards, everybody in the palace was his family. So that's what Daniel had to deal with. And that was tough. That was tough. And I always, I was, you know, I always thought about that, like, man. And, and that's something that you don't hear enough about. You don't hear about Daniel not being able to have a family. Just the, the mental torture from that alone. To just know that part of your life will never become a reality. You're always going to be that way. So let's take a look now at the four kings that Daniel served under. Now, it's important for you to know this because I, I want I want to set the tone for you to understand that this Daniel fast is much more than just 21 days. Daniel had a long history that went way back. Daniel went through so many things before that fast even came about. Daniel went through so much that led him to, to seek and to pursue God, which is what fasting is all about. Fasting is not getting God to change his mind about something. You know, sometimes we have this idea that, you know what, if I could just fast for three days, I'm going to get God to change his mind. Daniel understood that when you fast, you're aligning and realigning yourself with the good and with the perfect will of God. Now, I talked about this before that you have God's permissive will and God's perfect will. When you are fasting, you align yourself with God's perfect will for your life. And Daniel always desired to be in the perfect will of God. Daniel always desired to be aligned with God because as you're going to learn, the Babylonian rule was a different beast. So the first king that Daniel served under was King Nebuchadnezzar. He's probably one of the most famous kings, you know, during that time, you know, the most powerful king at that time. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar likely started, he became a king when he was, um, he was 30 years old, right? He ascended the throne. Um, he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, founder of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He became king after the death of his father in 605 BC. That was around the time that Daniel was captured, who was taken captivity. So once Nebuchadnezzar's father died, he became king. And then he just went on this rampage to just conquer, conquer and, you know, just conquer and take over. So Daniel's responsibility, and we're going to look more into Daniel's responsibility and roles later on. But to give an overview, Daniel served as a wise advisor, especially known for interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, such as uh, the statue dream. In Daniel 2, um, he held a high position in the royal courts. So Daniel was in was part of what was going on because Dan interpreted the, interpreted the dream. Daniel was given special privileges, right? So Daniel was, was privy to certain conversations that the average citizen, average citizen or average person in that kingdom didn't hear. Daniel was part of certain meetings. We'll take a look at that later on. So now let's go to the next king. The second king that, that Daniel was under was King Belshazzar. Um, like in his late thirties to early forties during his reign, uh, how he came into power. Belshazzar, Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the last official king of Babylon. While his father was away, Belshazzar acted as you know the king, effectively ruling Babylon during his father father's absence. Um, so Daniel's role in King Belshazzar's kingdom was um, to interpret the mysteries writing on the wall. I believe in Daniel 5, during Belshazzar's feast, he foretold the immediate downfall of the Babylonian Empire. But yet, despite Daniel's warnings, Belshazzar did not heed them and was killed that very night as Babylon fell to the Persians. 
So after Daniel, um, after Belshazzar was killed that same night, then a new empire came. So for 66 years, Daniel was part of the Babylonian rule. And we're going to take a look at the, the difference between both systems. What made them different, right? So Daniel later on came under the um, the rule of Darius the Mede. So Darius the Mede was in his early 60s at the time of his reign. So now Daniel go from being under kings that were in the 30s and 40s to not being controlled by kings in the 60s by the Persian. So Darius was appointed ruler of Babylon by Cyprus the Great after the Persian Empire. Persians captured the city. So Daniel role during that time was um, one of the three high officials overseeing the satraps or the governors. And he had he was highly regarded um, because of his faithfulness to God, even in the face of persecution, you know, trials and tribulation. Daniel stayed focused. So the last king that Daniel was under was King um, Cyprus the Great, again, the Persian Empire. So now Daniel go back from being under King that was in the 60s to someone else like in the late 40s uh, when he captured Babylon. So the Persians took over Babylon, they captured Babylon. Um, and this is around 539 B.C. And this marked the end of the Neo-Babylonian Empire and the beginning of a new era of Persian dominance. You know, I'm sure that you guys probably seen that movie, you know, um, 300. You know, really the the cinematography in that movie, the action, I mean, everything was just like incredible, you know. Um, so it's a really good movie uh, by the Persian Empire. So he came, so Daniel's, like not much was recorded or talked about during that time because Daniel was, was already like in his latter, latter part of his, his life. You know, he probably, Daniel lived to about, you know, mid eighties to early nineties. So Daniel lived, you know, he lived a pretty good life, but it was a life that was filled with stress. It was a life that was a lot of pressure. It was a lot. So now let's dive into um, understanding the difference, the system between the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire. This is going to shed light as to why Daniel prayed the way that he did. Again, Daniel served under the Persian, I mean, the Babylonian Empire for 66 years. So from the time that Daniel was about 15 or 17 to his early 80s, Daniel was under the Babylonian Empire. Now, let's take a look at some key things about that empire. The Babylonian Empire, particularly under King Nebuchadnezzar, was highly central, centralized and authoritarian. That is when king ruled with absolute power. They often enforced strict loyalty and ensured uh, and using harsh punishment to maintain control. Babylonian kings such as Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, often demanded worship and viewed themselves as semi-divine figures, leading to a culture that glorified the king's authority. Now, I want to pause there and just kind of, you know, park that there for a minute. When you take a look at Daniel chapter 3, matter of fact, let's go to Daniel, Daniel 3 so that you can be able to see what I'm talking about. As a kid, this is my favorite story. When I read the story about Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, man, it just did something inside of me. I love, love this story. As a matter of fact, today, this is one of my favorite Bible stories. Because when I read it as a kid, it just, it did something inside of me. Now, this is when Nebuchadnezzar, okay, I want you to go back and read the whole thing, right? But I'm going to, Nebuchadnezzar made a golden image, An image of gold. So Daniel 3, 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three cubits and the breadth thereof of, um, six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So in layman's term, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar made was of himself. 
And that's where you see we get all those ideas for people today that they want to create a statue of, you know, um, famous people and, you know, and things like that. So the statue was 90 feet tall, okay, and nine feet wide. It was set up in a way that everyone can see. Everyone. You can be from a distance and you can see that statue. What the Babylonians did was they imposed their gods on you. They didn't give you the option if you wanted to worship their gods. They didn't ask for your opinion if you think their gods were good or evil. They didn't care how you felt about their gods. You were going to worship their gods as long as you were under their rule. You were going to worship their gods. Now, that was a problem because Daniel was like, look, I, I can't get with this. This just doesn't rock with me. With my belief in the one true God, I can't do this. So right off the back, there was the spiritual atmosphere that Daniel was under was immense. The spiritual atmosphere that Daniel was under was intense. The spiritual atmosphere that Daniel was under was, was intense every day. And because Daniel had a, a role in the king's uh, in the king's government, Daniel had to pray. Daniel had to use wisdom because all the laws were against them. The policies were against them. I mean, everything left and right. Because Babylon, listen, they did not care what God you serve. If you did not serve their God or serve and worship the king. So when the king made that statue and he got the whole place to come, 90 feet tall, long and wide, he said to them, bow down. And worship that statue. Worship me. You know the Babylonian kings saw themselves as gods. And if you did not see them as gods. There's a problem. They wanted to set an example to every person that disobeyed them. So when you read Daniel 3. And when the king said to those everybody. When you have the sound of the music. When you hear this, you hear that, you need to bow down and worship. I want you to imagine hundreds and thousands of people probably out there. And they bow down to this image. And yet you saw three Hebrew boys just sticking out like a sore thumb. They said, we refuse to submit to this God. We're not going down. Nope, we're not. That took a lot of guts. Now, the Bible said that when Nebuchadnezzar saw this, he was enraged. He was furious because, again, the Babylonian mindset was conquer, was dominance, was authoritarian. You can't tell them what to do. So when Nebuchadnezzar saw these three men, these three Hebrew boys, he's like, nah, y'all don't get it. You're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong house. You're going to come in my house and not worship my gods and not worship me. I'm like, I'm like a God and you dare not worship me. They said, listen, King. Our God gave us a commandment. And the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. So these three Hebrew boys, <clears throat> excuse me, they stood there. They stood their ground. They were ready for anything. They said, I love, love what they said to the king. Oh, my goodness. I love what they said to the king. Everybody worship. Let's pick up the conversation now. Verse 14. This is what Nebuchadnezzar said. After he was furious, he was enraged at these three boys. How dare you not worship this image? How dare you not worship me? Again, Babylon, they told you what to do. They didn't ask your opinion for nothing. If you didn't obey, they killed you right off the spot. 
So Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? Nebuchadnezzar was saying to him, listen, are you guys out of, out of your mind? Do you want to die? Do you know who I am? Do you know this is my house? Again, at the time, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful king on the planet. He was just whatever Nebuchadnezzar said, Babylon was was the place to be. And here you got this three boys captive, captive and being held in another kingdom, not even their home. And they have the audacity to defy the king's orders. Here's what the king said to him, Daniel 3.15. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instrument. And here's his warning to them. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue from my power? He didn't say we're going to throw you in the fire five minutes later. Submission by fear is what Nebuchadnezzar was great at. Submission by fear is what Babylon was known for. That's why they were feared, man. They were feared around the world. Because if you refuse to do what they did, they made an example out of you. So the rest of the nations will not repeat that same thing. So he said to the three Hebrew boys, listen, I understand you guys are still young. I, I give you that much. You, you're still young. You probably didn't understand the instructions that was given to you. You probably misheard, you know, maybe it was a language barrier. So I'm going to come to you and I'm going to break this down for you personally. The king. I'll break it down for you. Maybe you can understand what, what was said before. Maybe because the music was too loud. The voices were too loud. So let, let me let me bring it down to your level. Here, listen, here's what's going to happen. We're going to do this again. One more chance just for three of you guys. Just because I'm trying to be nice. We're going to do this again. When you listen, when y'all have the sound of music, all the instruments playing, I need you to get down and worship this image. I need you to get down. When they said that to this boys, here's what they responded back to the king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. They're looking at King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king in the world. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. So after the king came to him and said that, they said, listen, listen, King, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, we understand what you're saying. We hear you loud and clear. We don't need your interpretation of what was said before. We understand. We speak the language. We know what was said. We know what you're requesting of us to do. But we got a we got a we got a big problem with that. I don't think you understand that we serve no other gods but the one true God. I don't think you understand that our knees, our faces will never touch the ground to worship any other one but our God. I don't think you understand that we serve the king of kings. You might be the king of little kings, but we serve the king of kings. As they were talking, the demonic forces were enraged. In the realm of the spirits, the demons were angry. In the realm of the spirits, the angels were waiting. In the realm of the spirit, the angels were saying, y'all got this because we're behind you. The angels were waiting. And a lot of times 
we don't activate angelic help because we don't speak the word of God. We speak our opinion. We speak our feelings. We speak what we like, what we don't like, but we don't speak the word of God. They stood on the, 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 the never failing word of God. They stood on it. Let's keep reading this because I need you to understand the system of Babylon. We're living in a Babylonian style system today. So before you go jump in doing the Daniel fast, before you go jump in saying you want to go for 21 days and da, 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 you got to understand the system that you're under. You need to understand the warfare that comes with that. There was significant warfare when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the king. There was significant warfare that was going on at that time. And I believe it's for uh, Second Kings when Elisha was with the servant and uh, they were surrounded by the Syrians. Elisha's servant was afraid. He was like, oh my goodness, you know, we're, we're, we don't have anywhere to go. We're overpowered. Elisha said to him, listen, man, listen, listen, bro, relax. Elisha said, oh, heavenly father, open his eyes to see, not the physical eyes, but if you would just open his spiritual eyes to see what he is missing, the Bible said that when his eyes were open, he saw a host chariots that were ready. So when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just wasn't talking from a physical standpoint. They knew.